Today will be the last lecture of the series and to conclude it I wish to do two things. First, I wish to tell you as I promised last time of the most recent synthesis achieved in respect of the symmetries of the nuclear force. Second, I wish to speak of two other forces of nature, the gravitational force and the so-called weak force. With this, my survey of all known forces of nature will be complete. I shall finally make some remarks about the general outlook in the subject. I ended the last lecture by speaking of the SU3 symmetry scheme as the basic underlying symmetry of the nuclear force. You may recall that the symmetry takes its name from three types of charges electric, hyper and isotopic. The symmetry lies in treating all these three charges as if they were manifestations of just one single unitary entity. It's perhaps good to remind you once again when I use the words manifestations of a single unitary entity I do not wish to load the phrase manifestation or unitary with philosophical or mystical connotations. Let's never forget that mathematics is the language of physics and all words which we use in physics have a precise and a mathematical sense. I also said in my last lecture that using Sophus Lee's ideas one also learned that as a consequence of the SU3 symmetry scheme nucleons and mesons must be found in nature in multiplets of eights or tens or twenty sevens and this seems confirmed by experiment. Now throughout these lectures you may have noticed that elementary particles and elementary phenomena have been characterized by two types of properties. First are the so-called internal properties like electric charge or hypercharge. Second are the external properties like spin. Spin is external because it has deeper roots in the structure of something external to all of us, the structure of space and time. It had always been a recurring dream in physics that someday one may be able to find a deeper unification between these two types of properties that internal and external properties might merge together in one single whole. This then would be the ultimate synthesis and it's the story of this synthesis achieved in the last few months that I wish to tell you during the first part of today's lecture. Before I go on to discuss the new symmetry itself, let's briefly go over the concepts of spin once again. In terms of Sophus Lee's ideas, intrinsic spin symmetry may be called the SU2 symmetry. This is because we have learnt in the fourth lecture a spin one half particle can be pictured as an object rotating either clockwise or anti-clockwise relative to its direction of motion. In terms of multiplets, these two left and right spinning objects form a two-fold multiplet. In Lee's language, just as three varieties of charge give rise to an SU3 symmetry, 
two varieties of spin give rise to an SU2 symmetry. Just as SU3 multiplets consist of 8, 10 or 27 particles, one can show that spin multiplets, the multiplets of SU2, would contain two or three or four different spinning objects. To take a concrete example, in nature we have eight particles of spin one half and ten of spin three half. In making these counts of eights and tens, we made no distinction of left spin from right spin. If we do make this distinction, the multiplets really consist of 8 times 2, that is 16 objects, and 10 times 4, that is 40 distinguishable objects, making up a total of 16 plus 40, 56 distinguishable entities. Now, as a first part of the program to synthesize spin with charge, let's assume that the right and the left spins can be treated on a basis completely analogous to the three types of charges. That is to say, consider a total of six types of charges. Electric charge spinning clockwise, electric charge spinning anticlockwise, hypercharge spinning clockwise, hypercharge, spinning anticlockwise, and so on. These six charges will now give rise to a new Lie group. The new Lie structure will be SU6, six, six corresponding to the six types of charges. Now the mathematics, the group theory of the SU6 structure has its own volition. One can either look up Lie's works or work out oneself diagrammatically the structure of the SU6 multiplets. The first result one discovers to one's astonishment is that the lowest nucleon multiplet of SU6 must contain precisely 56 entities. I said astonishment because 56 is just the number of distinguishable nucleons which I said a moment ago we know of in nature. This 56-fold multiplet of SU6 now contains both the familiar protons and the neutrons as well as the exotic omega minus, which I may remind you, I said in my second lecture, in my fourth lecture, there are just two specimens known to us in the whole universe. A still deeper synthesis has been achieved. Spin half and spin three half nucleons are no longer distinct. Fifty six of them form one single entity. Spin is nothing but a new form of charge. One has married internal symmetries of charge with the external symmetries of spin and space time. The basic idea of marrying spin with charge was first conjectured essentially 27 years ago by the great Hungarian physicist Wigner. In its present form, the symmetry principle was worked out in September of last year by Professor Fezar Gourset, a Turk, by Professor Redicati, an Italian, and by Professor Sakita, a young Japanese physicist. Now the SU6 symmetry scheme was profound, but it was not profound enough. It had one serious flaw. When speaking of space-time and of its synthesis with charge, one must make sure that the space-time concepts one uses accord with the theory of relativity. The situation with spin in 1964 was the same as the one which Dirac faced in 1928. At that time one knew of the spinning electrons, but spin seemed to have no relevance to relativity. Dirac had the audacity to put relativity first. 
He did not consciously look for the spin of the electron. A synthesis of relativity with quantum theory led him automatically to the concept of electrons spin. What we wanted was a similar miracle to happen for the case of nuclear particles. One would like to merge relativity onto the structure of the three types of charges, electric, hyper and isotopic. One wanted the analog of Dirac's equation for the electron, but this time for the proton. And this was precisely what was achieved in January of this year. Roughly speaking, corresponding to the four dimensions of space and time, one constructs a structure SU4. Combining this with the SU3 symmetry of nuclear physics, one emerges with the natural synthesis of 3 times 4 SU12. This perhaps is then the ultimate symmetry of the nuclear force. The multiplets extend once again from 56 to 364 particles. What is much more important, one is at long last the full dynamics of nuclear physics. And further, and still more important, it's unlikely that a higher symmetry can be found to displace SU-12. This is because unless and un until one discovers that space-time has more than four dimensions, until such time that one discovers more than just three charges, SU-12 is the maximal symmetry one could achieve. Perhaps at long last we appear to be coming to the end of the road, to the end of the discovery of the pattern of the carpet. One can perhaps at long last write down a quantitative measure of the nuclear force. In the dream of Yukawa in 1935, the problem which eluded physics for the last 30 years. It will no doubt make you also elated to learn that most of this work was done, or rather a significant part in this work was played by your compatriots, notably at the International Center for Theoretical Physics at Trieste. Some of the names concerned in the development are those of Mirza Baki Beg, Dr. M. A. Rashid, Dr. Fayyazuddin, and others. This concludes what I wanted to say about nuclear force. Let us take stock of the situation once again. We have so far discussed two forces in all these lectures, the electric and the nuclear. These two forces give us a complete comprehension of the world of the atom and also of the world of the nucleus. There are, in addition, however, to these two forces, two more forces in nature. One is the ever-present classical force of gravitation, the first universal force to be discovered, the force which holds us all captives to the surface of the Earth. Every particle in nature carries what one may call a gravitational charge. The astonishing thing about gravitational charge is that unlike all other charges, there is only one type of gravitational charge. There are no positives or negatives among them. Put it another way, every particle in nature attracts every other particle. There is no gravitational force of repulsion. A second remarkable fact about gravitation is its, is its extreme weakness. Relative to the electrical force, the gravitational force is a billion, billion, billion times weaker. To give you an idea of the orders of magnitude involved, let's make a comparison. The gravitational force, the gravitational pull on the surface of the Earth is the result 
of all the matter contained within the earth itself. An ordinary electromagnet used for lifting material about a centimeter or so in length can produce an electromagnetic force as strong as the pull exerted by the whole of the earth. Size by size, a tiny electrical system is as potent as the pull exerted by the whole sphere, by the whole of matter contained within the earth's sphere. The question arises, if the gravitational force is so weak, why is it so persistent Why the electrical force is not? We are all made up of electrons and protons. We are electrical systems. But none of us exert electrical forces on anyone else, even though the electrical force is so very much more powerful. The reason is the one I have already mentioned. Electrical charge is of two types, positive and negative, while the gravitational charge is of only one sign. The electrical force cancels itself out. The gravita gravitational force never cancels itself. Another question which arises with the gravitational force is the following. Are there any carriers of the gravitational force? just like the carriers of the electrical and the nuclear forces. To remind you, the photon, the quantum of light, is the carrier of electrical force. The meson is the carrier of the nuclear force. Is there an analogous particle, a particle which we may call the graviton? Theoretically, perhaps there should be. Experimentally, unfortunately, we do not know because of the tenuous weakness of the gravitational force, it would be extremely hard to detect these carriers if they exist. This is surely one of the things which perhaps the 21st century physicist will know much more about. In addition to gravity, there is one more force of nature, the so-called weak force. It's something very peculiar. Its very existence was unknown until the neutron was discovered in 1930. It's a force which seems to have just one purpose, to make all elementary particles decay. Whereas a free proton or a free electron, left to themselves, live on forever. This is not the case for a free neutron or a free meson. Left to themselves, a free neutron disappears in about 10 minutes. It decays into a proton, an electron, and a new and a rather mysterious object called the neutrino. It is as if the neutron was really a time bomb, its fuse rate being determined by the so-called weak force. The neutrino, the signature of this weak force, is a particle of spin one half, <clears throat> it's electrically neutral, it travels with the velocity of light, and it has one more extraordinary peculiarity. Whereas left spinning neutrinos exist, there are no right spinning neutrinos. The neutrino does not obey the mirror symmetry principle. Like Hoffman in Offenbach's opera, a neutrino reflected in a mirror sees no shadow of itself. Why this is so, we do not know at all. Summarizing once again, we have four types of forces. The strongest is the nuclear. The next is electrical, 100 times weaker than the nuclear force. The next is the so-called weak force, a million times weaker. And the still next, the gravitational force, a billion, billion, billion times weaker still. All particles can be considered manifestations of one of these forces. The nuclear force seems to obey the SU-12 symmetry law. Its multiplets consist of 364 or more particles. The photon the quantum of light is the signature of the electromagnetic force. 
while the neutrino is the signature of the weak force. The electric and the nuclear forces seem to be fairly well understood. So is the gravitational force since the days of Newton and Einstein. The weak force is completely mysterious. Still more mysterious, however, is the fact of why all these forces are divided in this somewhat arbitrary manner. Why do they possess such different symmetry properties? Why do their strengths vary so very much? Physics can never rest till this final synthesis comes. The synthesis which, for example, can include not only the electric and the nuclear charges, but also the gravitational. We have certainly not solved the whole of physics. In Oppenheimer's phrase, the future will be only more radical and not less, only more strange and not more familiar, and it will have its own new insights for the inquiring mind. The same thought was perhaps expressed some while ago by Faiz Ahmed Faiz. Kei baar uski khatir zare zare ka jigar jira magar ye chashme hairan jiski hairani nahin jati. If there is one hallmark of true science, if there is one perception that scientific knowledge heightens, it's the spirit of hairani, of tahayyur, of wonder. The deeper that one goes, the more profound that one sees, the more is one's sense of wonder increased. The theme of my series of lectures has been the search for unity in the understanding of nature. In the first lecture I said, man has always believed in an eventual unity, an eventual simplicity, an eventual symmetry, which we shall discover in the scheme of things. If I have done anything, I hope to have shown you that allied with the wonder for God's creation, that allied with this wonder is the inescapable fact that all explanation we have ever found is based on symmetry concepts. Time and, time and again we have seen that whenever we are faced with two rival theories, both claiming to explain the same set of phenomena, one has always found that the theory more aesthetically satisfying, more beautiful, is also the correct one. The holy book has proclaimed this faith of the scientist in Surah Mulk. Matara fi khalkir rahmani min tafawut. Farji al basara haltara min futur. Thou seest not in the creation of the all merciful any imperfection. Return thy gaze, seest thou any fissure. Then return thy gaze again and again and thy gaze comes back to thee, dazzled, aweary. <laughs>